Introduction to Water-Soluble Polymers Section 1. Nomenclature and Structure A working knowledge of polymers is essential for any engineer, uh, with maybe the exclusion of an electrical engineer. But the body of knowledge pertaining to polymers is extremely vast and fairly mature when it comes to most synthetic polymers. However, biopolymers and water-soluble synthetic polymers, which will be the focus in this course, tend to be more elusive. For the most part, polymers in their solid form are fairly easy to spot. If a solid is about as dense as water, like plastic or even wood, it's probably a polymer in some sort or another. However, in addition to these obvious polymers, there are many hidden polymers in the world, in particular in our everyday life. The difficult part is accumulating enough knowledge to distinguish, or sometimes just know, which polymer is present. To better prepare you, as an engineering student, for the remainder of this course, and the industrial workplace, this section will get you started in developing your working polymer knowledge base. To begin with, let's briefly discuss the nomenclature surrounding polymer technology. The nomenclature used for polymers is typical of all science fields, in the sense that it's a mixture of organized naming schemes designed to be unambiguous, acronyms, and existing or the more common names. Of course, there are different types of polymers. They are classified based more on their origins than their actual composition. Natural polymers, also referred to as biopolymers, are all of the large molecules found in nature. Semi-synthetic polymers are polymers which are found in nature, but then processed and chemically modified. Synthetic polymers are large molecules which are synthesized by man, either in a research lab or in an industrial plant. Inorganic polymers are large molecules which are not composed entirely of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen along their backbones. Silica, sand, and silica oils are good examples of inorganic polymers, based on silicon rather than carbon. We will not get into these types here. In general, the term macromolecules means large molecules, and is used as an umbrella term, encompassing all large molecules exceeding a thousand daltons, or a thousand grams per mole. By convention, when the term polymer is used alone, it refers to the synthetic polymers synthesized by man and not in nature. However, technically all of these types of macromolecules are all polymers. This is why you will find the terms macromolecules and polymers used interchangeably. Uh, we'll define them a little bit more clearly uh, in some upcoming slides. Undoubtedly, we come in contact with and are definitely reliant upon macromolecules every day, even without recognizing it. Let's take a look where. The DNA that stores and maintains life as we know it? Yep, that's a polymer. And beyond the DNA, there are many more polymers found in biological systems. Proteins, which include enzymes, collagen, keratin, elastin, and even silk, are all biopolymers. Polysaturides, like cellulose, hemicellulose, Kitten, xylan, manin, and starch are also biopolymers. Starch can be found in many plants. We harvest quite a few just because of their high starch content. The plants use this biopolymer to store energy, since the glucose units that make up starch can be broken off and used for energy later. Plants will also use biopolymers for their mechanical properties, too. Cellulose is one of the main structural building blocks in the plant kingdom. This biopolymer is what gives wood, cotton, and other plants their amazing strength, all the while staying light and much less dense than other strong materials made out of metals. Basically, cellulose, with the addition of hemicellulose and lignin, is nature's form of plastic. Speaking of plastics, synthetic polymers are found all around us in today's world. Everything from toys to bottles to tires are synthetically made polymers that we put to good use in everyday consumer items. If you look into most products, you can find polymers somewhere. Does Coke have polymers? No. But the can you drink it from does. I know what you're thinking. Aluminum isn't a polymer. It's a metal. You're right. But Coke, and most canned goods, would eat through that aluminum can before it even hit the grocery store shelf. All metal cans have a coating on the inside to protect the metal. 
And guess what? Those coatings are almost always a polymer. Shampoo? Makeup? Toothpaste? And all these other personal hygiene products? These don't seem like plastics. But they're not. But they all still have a significant amount of polymer in them. Many times, polymers are added simply to achieve the desired viscosity or thickness to a product. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to use shampoo that was as thin and runny as water? It would flow right off of your hand before you were able to use it. Hence, shampoos are always thick and viscous, like the consistency of honey. It stays in a pile in your hand long enough for you to use it in your hair. Now, how is that accomplished? You guessed it. Polymers. These sorts of polymers are hydrophilic and oftentimes water-soluble. Eventually, in this course, we will discuss how such polymers influence the solutions they are in. This is the main reason we are discussing polymers here. You will need a working understanding of polymers in order to understand how they can be used in so many different ways. To begin with, let's nail down some definitions and nomenclature so that we are all using the same language when discussing the polymers. It's important to know some of the general terms used when discussing polymers. The term macromolecule refers to a relatively large molecule, while the term polymer is typically used to describe a large molecule composed of a small number of repeating subunits. I want to clarify this distinction. Both terms refer to structures with molar masses greater than about a thousand grams per mole. The term macromolecule is said to be the general term because it simply refers to any large molecule, while the term polymer, which is a specific type of macromolecule, technically has the added requirement that it be built from small units that are repeated along the chain. Our focus will be on polymers, synthetic and natural, as well as semi-synthetic. Even though we are looking at a large molecule, let's begin this discussion about polymer terminology with the monomer. The chemicals reacted to produce polymers are referred to as monomers, shown here on the left. These are the small molecules used to make polymers. The chemical reaction that covalently bonds the monomers together to form polymers is known as polymerization. Obviously, after polymerization, the monomer structure is changed slightly. The form that the reacted monomer takes within the final chain structure of the generated polymer is referred to as its monomer residual, or mer, or repeat unit. It is the chemical structure of this unit that is typically used to describe the polymer. Note that the monomer, not the monomer residual, is used when naming the resulting polymer. Since the polymer chains can get long, far too big to easily draw out, Polymer chemists oftentimes draw the chemical structure of the entire polymer chain by simply drawing the monomer residual, or that repeat unit, in parentheses. This notation is handy, because it simplifies the drawing, but also because the degree of polymerization is shown explicitly. Here, the number of times the repeat unit repeats, the degree of polymerization, or just dp, is given the value n. Using N for the DP when the degree of polymerization is meant to be unspecified is common practice. I will use both representations for polymers throughout the course. This later shortened form is best when the chemical structure of the residual monomers is important. On the other hand, the lengthy form is useful when only the backbone of the polymer chain is of importance. Actually, I often draw just the backbone when the side groups are unimportant. Simply put, the backbone is shown here in, in a teal color, is the line of covalently bonded atoms stretching from one end of the polymer to the other. When discussing the structure of polymers, two different concepts come up. We will be going over each of them in more detail, but briefly, the configuration of a polymer refers to which monomer residuals, the repeat units, are attached and how they are attached to each other, while the conformation of the polymer refers to the shape of the polymer's backbone. The configuration of the polymer describes the repeat unit and how they are connected. Is the monomer glucose or xylose? Is a particular mer connected to two other mers or three? 
Is the stereochemistry of the connections the same? These are the types of questions that the configuration of the polymer answers. Let's look at an example to see how a change in configuration can completely change the polymer in question. Shown here is a generic D-glucopyranose monomer. This is the common cyclic form glucose takes when in water. You will notice that the stereochemistry of the C1 hydroxyl group is shown as a wavy line. That is because I'm being intentionally unspecific with the orientation of this bond. It does matter, as we will see. If the C1 hydroxyl group were to be coming out at us, this would re be referred to as beta deglucopyranose. If we were to connect this C1 hydroxyl group to the C4 hydroxyl group of the next beta deglucopyranose mer, we would have what is commonly referred to as cellulose. However, if we start with alpha deglucopyranose and make this same connection between the C1 and the C4 hydroxyl groups, we end up with a completely different polymer. In this case, we have amylose, which is found in starch. Here you can see that changing the orientation of just one covalent bond can have drastic effects on the resulting polymer. Notice that in order to switch between amylose and cellulose, you would have to break the C1 bond and reattach it from a different angle. Let's continue on with our glucose example. If the beta D glucopyranose repeat units were also connected from the C1 hydroxyl group to the C6 location, we now have a polymer which is no longer linear. More about this in upcoming slides. However, this added option for connectivity between the MERS gives this polymer different properties from the original amylose. It is another component in starch and its chemical name is amylopectin. In contrast to the configuration of a polymer, there is the conformation of the polymer to consider. Essentially, the conformation of a polymer is its overall shape. We will discuss this concept in more detail in upcoming slides, but give you a visual example. Let's look at an essential protein we all rely on, hemoglobin. In order for hemoglobin to do its job, to both bind with oxygen at the lungs and then release it throughout the body, it needs to change its conformation. Shown here is the slight change in the shape of hemoglobin as it takes in the O2 molecule and then also as it releases the oxygen. Amazingly enough, this slight change is all the difference required to transport oxygen throughout our bodies. As we will see, this sort of specific control and structure, both configuration and conformation, is very commonplace amongst the natural polymers, but lacking in the synthetic polymers, where we lack such fine control at the molecular level. To begin our in-depth look at polymer configuration, we consider the monomer residuals. In the simplest case, we have a polymer composed of all the same repeat units. This type of configuration results in what is referred to as a homopolymer. Adding some complexity, we have a polymer made from two different monomers, shown here as blue and red molecules. The resulting polymer thus has two different types of monomer residuals and is referred to as a copolymer. At the moment, the arrangement of the red and the blue MERS doesn't matter. Just the fact that there are both blue and red repeat units within the polymer structure results in a copolymer. We will discuss the arrangement in the next slide. Of course, there can be more than just two different types of MERS in a polymer. Here, three distinct monomer residuals are shown, and the result is referred to as a ter polymer. In general, any polymer that has more than just a single type of repeat unit is referred to as a heteropolymer. Now, for the arrangement of different monomer residuals along the polymer chain, we are only going to show two distinct types. Thus, the polymer in question would be a copolymer. Keep in mind that the definitions also work for heteropolymers with more than two types of mers. The copolymer used as an example on the previous slide had these same blue and red repeat units alternating in every other fashion. When the repeat units alternate along the chain, the arrangement is referred to as an alternating, and thus the polymer as a whole is referred to as an alternating copolymer. 
a slightly more complex variant of the alternating arrangement is the periodic arrangement. As you can see here, rather than a single type of blue myrrh followed by a single type of red myrrh, we have a specific number of blue myrrhs followed by a specific number of red myrrhs, and the pattern continues. If you look at the pictorialized chemical structure shown on the right, you can see that each myrrh is repeated with the subscripts A and B, and then the whole set is repeated, denoted with the subscript N. I want to point out that A and B can be the same number, but they don't have to be. Shown in this example, A equals 3 and B equals 2. Hopefully, you can see that in the long form on the left. Also, I want to point out that the alternating arrangement above is simply a very special case of the periodic arrangement, where both A and B equal 1. The logical progression and disorder here is a copolymer where the two different myrrhs are really placed at random along the chain. This arrangement is technically referred to as statistical, because achieving a truly random placement isn't possible with current polymerization techniques. However, both the term random and statistical end up being used interchangeably. The pictorialized chemical structure off to the right introduces a new convention. When more than one MERS are placed along the chain in a non-periodic form, the term CO is placed between them along the backbone. This denotes that the order shown is not important. Only the overall degree of polymerization of each repeat unit shown here as N, units of the blue myrrh intermixed with M, units of red myrrh per entire copolymer chain. Some natural polymers and most synthetic polymers are statistical heteropolymers. In contrast, let's look at a copolymer where the co is specifically omitted in the chemical structure. The result is a copolymer where all N blue myrrhs are grouped on one side of the polymer with all M red MERS grouped on the other side. This is a special case with some cool properties and it is referred to as a block copolymer. As always, this arrangement is not limited to only two different types of MERS. There can be more types of repeat units, not to mention there can be more than just two blocks. For example, a common configuration of block copolymers is to use only two different types but to put a block of blue MERS, then a block of red MERS, and then another block of blue MERS. Thus, both ends of this so-called tri-block copolymer are blue blocks, while the middle portion is a long red block. The phase separation that this causes in the final product is an advanced polymer topic, and won't be discussed here, but it is a nice example of how the arrangement of the MERS can have significant effects on the resulting polymers. The last topic for polymer configuration is architecture. This describes how the MERS are connected. Up to this point, all of the depictions have been of polymer chains. This is the simplest architecture and is referred to as linear. Every MERS is connected to two others and a long chain is formed. However, if a MER connects to more than two other repeat units, as shown here, a branched architecture results. Note that here there are relatively few MERS capable of bonding to three other MERS, in comparison to the amount of MERS only capable of bonding with two other MERS. Thus, the polymer resembles a tree, with the main chain looking like the trunk of a tree, and then the branches shooting off to the sides. If a polymer is composed of enough MERS capable of bonding to three other MERS, the result is a network polymer. Notice that essentially, the entire polymer sample ends up being covalently bonded together in some form or fashion. Thus, the entire polymer sample is essentially a single molecule. Another method to achieve a single molecule similar to a network polymer is to take a sample of linear polymer chains and covalently bond them together. This introduction of covalent bonds from one polymer chain to another is referred to as cross-linking. The resulting polymer sample resembles a network polymer in the sense that it is one massive molecule. But cross-linkages are not monomer residuals. That's the only difference. Vulcanized rubber, like the rubber in tires, is a common polymer that has been cross-linked to achieve tougher mechanical properties. So if you think about it, 
a tire is one big molecule. Now that's a macromolecule. Returning to the branched polymer, there are a couple of varieties worth mentioning. First, a brush or comb polymer has multiple branches all coming off of the same main branch. These are typically fairly dense with side chains, giving it a brush or comb-like appearance. Branched polymers with a center where the branches stem from are referred to as star polymers. There are also dendromer polymers, which are very similar to star polymers, except for that rather than only having a single center branching point, the branches also split and continue to branch out. Even though all of these shapes seem very different, they all share a common component. Branch points occur where the three or more mers are linked together. Oftentimes this is accomplished by a monomer selected for this specific purpose. The different architectures arise from the different places to put the branch points in the polymer molecule. Brush polymers have multiple, and very periodic, branch points along the main chain. Star polymers only employ one branch point per molecule, right at the center. Lastly, I should mention that if the branches are composed of a different monomer residual than the main chain, these polymers are not homopolymers, and specifically referred to as graft copolymers. Now that we understand the different ways a polymer can be put together, let's look at how they're named. Since there are so many different polymers, naming them can become a daunting task. Most of the natural polymers have common names, while the synthetic polymers are given names according to the chemicals they are produced from. Simple homopolymers are the easiest to name. You start with the name of the monomer used to synthesize the polymer and simply add the term poly before it. One detail to remember if the monomer name has more than one word to it, of which many do, then you put the monomer name in parentheses. Take this polymer for example. I have the chemical structure of the repeat unit shown. Note that the monomer residual is shown in the parentheses. The monomer used to synthesize this polymer looks like this. As we discuss polymers and polymerization methods in particular, you will become more and more familiar with the distinction and similarities between monomers and monomer residuals. However, at the moment, we are interested only in the name of the monomer. The monomer is known as vinyl chloride. If we follow the naming scheme outlined above, we see that the polymer is named polyvinyl chloride. Note that because the monomer name is composed of two words, vinyl and chloride, parentheses are put around the monomer name to show that the prefix poly pertains to both words. Thus, the name suggests the same thing as the chemical structure of the polymer, that vinyl chloride is repeated many times to make this polymer. Naming a copolymer is similar to naming a homopolymer, except for required extra information. Again, we start with the names of the monomers and add poly to the beginning. Unlike before, there is no possibility of naming without parentheses. All of the names of the monomers go inside a single set of parentheses. Monomer names are separated by slashes, and they are listed from highest to lowest by composition. Now, we must add some information about exactly how much of each monomer residual is found in the copolymer. To do this, we add a ratio at the end of the name. As an example, we'll use the copolymer with its chemical structure shown here. You should recognize that one of the monomer residuals is the same as the previous example, used for naming polyvinyl chloride. Now we have another monomer residual mixed in. Vinyl chloride and vinyl acetate are the two monomers used to produce this copolymer. Thus, the final name of the copolymer, as shown on the right here, is polyvinyl chloride slash vinyl acetate, 90 to 10. Notice that both monomer names are in the parentheses, separated by a slash. 
The ratio of 90 to 10 is given at the end to indicate that the ratio of vinyl chloride to vinyl acetate is 90 to 10. Please understand that this does not necessarily mean that there are 90 mers of vinyl chloride mixed in with 10 mers of vinyl acetate. These numbers are ratios. It could mean that there are only 9 vinyl chlorides to 1 vinyl acetate, or something more complex, like 45 vinyl chlorides to 5 vinyl acetates. By convention, the numbers are chosen so that they add up to 100, and are then easily converted to percentages by the reader. Thus, it is easy to see that this particular copolymer is composed of 90% vinyl chloride and 10% vinyl acetate monomer residuals. Now that we've discussed some basic polymer concepts, don't worry, we will keep learning more of the basics. But first, I want to dive into a class of polymers not typically covered in most polymer courses, polyelectrolytes. These are polymers that possess functional groups that are, or at least can be, charged. Note that the charged functional groups must be on the monomer residuals, not just a single group on the end or something like that. We aren't just talking two or three groups when the term poly is used here. Like all polymers, the poly prefix means a lot of something, not just a few. You shouldn't be able to count them with your fingers. Anyway, there are a few different types of polyelectrolytes. The most predominant types are the polyanions. Just as the name suggests, these are polymers with negatively charged functional groups. Clearly, these would be acids but they can be strong or weak acid groups. Carboxylic acids are fairly weak acids, while other examples include sulfates, with their characteristic SL4 groups, and sulfonate groups, which only have three oxygens to go along with the sulfur atom. Unlike the carboxylic acid, both the sulfate and the sulfonate groups are strong acids, and therefore almost always charged despite the pH of the surrounding solution. Next, we have polycations. As the term cation suggests, these are polymers which possess positive charges. Basically, this means they have amine groups. The only variant is the degree to which the nitrogen atom has been covalently bonded to other non-hydrogen atoms. With primary, secondary, and even tertiary amines, there's always a hydrogen to lose. The special case I want to point out are the quaternary amines. They are always positively charged, and because of this, they are used extensively when a polycation immune to the effects of pH is desired. Lastly, polyamphalites are simply polymers, typically copolymers, which possess both positive and negative functional groups. Before we move on, I want to point out the relationship between pH and the charged state of the various polyelectrolytes. Weak acids are charged only if deprotonated. This occurs only if the pH is above the pKa of the acid functional group. Similarly, weak bases are only charged when protonated, and this only occurs if the pH is below the pKa of the amine functional group. Thus, Weak polyelectrolytes, whether they are acids or bases, are strongly dependent on pH. Conversely, strong polyelectrolytes, like sulfates, sulfonates, and the quaternary amines, are relatively pH independent because they remain charged, at least over most normal pH ranges. As you can imagine, determining the amount of charge on a weak polyelectrolyte will differ depending on the pH. However, First, let's take a look at the simpler case of determining the amount of charge on a strong electrolyte. Charge density is the most common form of communicating the amount of charge on a polyelectrolyte. It is often abbreviated as simply CD, and is defined as the number of charges per mass of polymer. Convenient units typically end up as millimoles per gram. Keep in mind that although the definition is for the polymer as a whole, it is always easiest to calculate the charge density from the perspective it is always easiest to calculate the charge density from the perspective of the monomer residuals for example we have polyacrylate 
Don't worry about the pH effects just yet. The question states that it is fully ionized. The chemical structure of sodium polyacrylate looks like this. We see that it is a salt. Notice the counter ion is sodium plus. Since we know that it will completely dissociate and remain completely ionized, the question told us so, we see that each monomer residual of acrylate will contribute one charge to the polymer. Technically, we could use the degree of polymerization, denoted with the subscript N just outside of the parentheses, to say that there will be N number of charges for the shown polymer structure. However, we don't need to. We only need to calculate the charge density of the monomer residual, and we will then have the charge density of the entire polymer, no matter how large N is. Since we will be using molar values in the next step, I should point out that there will be one mole of charges in a mole of monomer residuals. So what's the molar mass of the acrylate monomer residual then? Well, let's add up the molar masses of all of the atoms and find out. Keep in mind that you must stay within the parentheses when doing this. We find three carbon atoms, each with a molar mass of 12, three hydrogens, not shown explicitly, two oxygens, each with a molar mass of 16, and lastly the counter ion of sodium, which weighs in at 23 grams per mole. Summing them all up, we find that the molar mass of the acrylate residual is 94 grams per mole. Now we're ready to calculate the charge density. To calculate charge density, we simply follow the definition above and divide the number of charges along the polymer by the mass of the polymer. Recognizing that the charge density of the monomer residual is the same as the charge density of the entire polymer, we concern ourselves with only a single repeat unit. I prefer to keep track of my units to ensure that I know what I have by the end. I suggest you do the same. So here you can see that I start with the amount of charge contributed by each repeat unit, abbreviated as RU, and then I divide by the molar mass of the repeat unit. Again, repeat unit is another term for the mer or monomer residual of the polymer. It's everything inside the parentheses of the chemical structure. We can see that the one mole of repeat units will cancel out nicely to leave us with 1 over 94, or 0 0.0106 moles per gram. However, throwing in a unit conversion of 1,000 millimoles per mole gives us the more conventional units and a final answer of 10.6 millimoles of charge per gram of polymer. That wasn't too bad, right? Let's take a look at how a copolymer can complicate the calculation. Now we look at polyacrylamide slash DADMAC, 90 to 10, as an example. For a brief moment, let's process what we have here. Firstly, what type, or in this case types, of polyelectrolytes are we dealing with? The most predominant mer in this copolymer is acrylamide, composing 90 mole percent of the final product. Is it a polyelectrolyte? And if so, which type? Noticing that there is an NH2 group, we figure that it is a primary amine. Actually, due to the doubly bonded oxygen right next to it, it's referred to as an amide. Okay, so we know that it is a polycation. Is it a weak or strong base? A quick Google search will tell you that the pKa of an amide like this is extremely high, above 14 in fact. Thus, it's safe to assume that it will remain protonated in any normal solution. Great! We don't have to keep track of the charges from the acrylamide myrrh, because it doesn't have any. Now, what about the next myrrh? The long name for this monomer is diallyl dimethyl ammonium chloride but it is more commonly known by its acronym, DADMAC. Again, is it a polyelectrolyte? In which type? Seeing the N+, surrounded by four covalent bonds, we recognize that it is a quaternary amine. Great! No pH dependency, and we can assume that it will completely ionize in solution. Here, the counter ion is chloride. The molar masses of each repeat unit are calculated as 71 for the acrylamide and 161 grams per mole for the DADMAC. We are ready to calculate the charge density, except for how do we deal with the fact that there are two different repeat units? 
which MER is used for the calculation. Well, we use both. What we really need to consider is the average repeat unit. Knowing that the molar ratio of M to N is 90 to 10, we can calculate the average molar mass of the repeat units by taking the percentage of acrylamide, 90% or 0.9, and multiplying it by the molar mass of acrylamide, and then doing the same for the DADMAC, 10% or 0.1 times 161 grams per mole of DADMAC. Summing up these two partial molar masses gives us the average molar mass of the repeat units in the copolymer as 80 grams per mole. The charge density calculation is then the same as before except that we are considering the average MER this time. The first two terms express the amount of charge in the average MER. Since only the DADMAC repeat unit contributes charge, we start with its molar ratio, 10%, or 0.1, in the overall copolymer and multiply it by the amount of charge per DADMAC mer. In this case, since it is completely ionized, we use one mole of charge for every mole of DADMAC. Note that this is where pH dependency could come into play. For this example, we don't have to worry about a pH dependency, though. As I mentioned before, quaternary amines aren't affected by pH. Back to the calculation at hand. The next term, the third term, is us dividing by the molar mass of the repeat unit. Again, we are considering the average repeat unit, so we are using the average molar mass that we just calculated, 80 grams per mole. Lastly. We convert millimoles to moles, and we come up with 1.25 millimoles of charge per gram of copolymer. Notice that this is about one-tenth of the charge density of the sodium polyacrylate homopolymer from above. This is because only 10% of this copolymer is charged. Only the DADMAC is ionized, and its molar ratio is 10%, so that makes sense. Using charge density to describe the amount of charge is typically used for synthetic polymers. How about natural polymers? Quantifying charge for natural polymers, and more so semi-synthetic polymers, is typically given in terms of degree of substitution, or DS. Simply put, degree of substitution is the percentage of monomer residuals modified chemically. An example of this is cationic starch. It is a semi-synthetic polymer because it is the result of chemically modifying an existing natural polymer, starch in this case. The positive functional groups are added as quaternary amines. The modification of the glucopyranose monomer residual here significantly increases the MERS molar mass, going from 162 to 312.5 grams per mole. You can calculate the average molar mass, M bar, if you know the M and N values of each type of repeat unit. But if we use the degree of substitution, we can calculate the average molar mass of the MERS without knowing M and N explicitly. All we need to know is the percentage of the total MERS that have been modified. In this case, 1 minus DS, is used for the percentage of the non-modified MERS, and DS is used as the percentage of the modified MERS. Let's try it out on cationic starch with the 5% DS. Converting degree of substitution into charge density is simply a manner of recalculating the average repeat unit molar mass like we did before. A 5% DS implies that 5% of the repeat units have been modified and 95% have been left untouched. Thus, we use 95% here to multiply times the molar mass of the unmodified glucopyranose. Similarly, we use 5% here to multiply times the molar mass of the modified repeat unit. Adding up the two terms, we end up with 169.5 grams per mole for the average molar mass of the repeat units. This leads us to the charge density calculation, just like we did in the last examples. We start with the number of charges per average repeat unit. Only 5% of the MERS are modified, 
and then every modified mer contains a quaternary amine, so they all contain charge. Secondly, we defined by the average mer molar mass. Lastly, we convert to more useful units, and we end up with 0.3 grams per mole as the charge density for a cationic starch with 5% degree of substitution. We have briefly discussed how to characterize and report the charge on a polymer. Now, let's discuss how that charge can be influenced by the surrounding solution. In essence, this is the pH dependency of the weak polyelectrolytes. The example I have shown here is a polyacid, but the polycations exhibit a similar phenomenon. Here, we have a dissolved polyacid in solution. The solution has a certain pH, and the charge on the polyacid would be negative, if any. The polyelectrolyte and any solution in its immediate vicinity required to dissolve it are referred to as the polyelectrolyte phase. We will denote the pH within the polyelectrolyte phase as pH sub P. Why a different pH value here? Well, the actual pH inside the polyelectrolyte phase will be slightly different from the pH out in the bulk. Not to mention, we can't measure the polyelectrolyte phase pH since the actual volume is so small. We can, however, say that the pH in the bulk will be greater than the pH in the polyacid phase. An easy way to remember this is to think of the protons as counter ions for the polyelectrolyte. The negatively charged polymer will try to keep the positively charged protons close by. So within the polyelectrolyte phase, the dissociation constant governing the relationship between the acid functional groups, which are protonated and which are dissociated, is called the intrinsic acid dissociation constant, and it is given the variable k sub naught. This is analogous to the pKa you should be familiar with for acids. Similarly, pK sub naught is defined as the log k naught, and the henderson hasselbalch equation then uses the pH within the polyelectrolyte phase, pH sub p, to define the extent of ionization. As a reminder, the percentage of the acid in the protonated form is alpha sub A. Please refer to the supplementary information if you need a refresher on the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and extent of ionization. Here, the term 1 minus alpha sub A represents the percentage of the polyacid functional groups that have been deprotonated, and therefore ionized. Of course, all of this seems like a moot point, since we still can't measure the pH sub P directly. However, we can redefine the equation using the bulk phase pH. The resulting acid dissociation constant is then referred to as the apparent acid dissociation constant, and can be calculated using the pH of the bulk phase. The apparent acid dissociation constant for polyelectrolytes pK app is not actually a constant at all. The pK app will shift as a function of the salt concentration, a ratio in acidic form as, denoted as alpha sub A, which makes it also a function of the pH. Let's compare the behavior of a polyacid with a small molecule acid to understand these dependencies. The extent of ionization for acids is defined as the percentage of the acid functional groups which have been deprotonated and no longer in their acid form. Since the percentage of the groups which are in their acid form is denoted as alpha sub A, we have the extent of ionization shown here as 1 minus alpha sub A. Plotting the extent of ionization versus the pH of the solution for a small molecule acid with only a single proton to donate, we end up with this characteristic S-curve. This makes sense. For an acid, when the pH is low, the extra protons in solution keep the acid molecules protonated. As the pH increases, and there is a relative deficit of protons in solution, the acid begins to donate its protons to the solution. In the process of donating these protons, the extent of ionization of the total amount of acid molecules in the solution becomes higher and higher, eventually reaching 100%.
The pH range over which the acid starts to dissociate and donate its protons is easy to spot, as the vertical portion of the S-curve. The acid dissociation constant for the particular acid, pKa, falls right where 50%, or half, as labeled here, of the acid molecules have been ionized, because they've been deprotonated. A pH range falling about one pH unit on either side of the pKa is where most of the deprotonation occurs. Thus, the vertical portion of the S-curve has a pretty sl steep slope to it. For polymers with acid functional groups, this pH range over which the acids are deprotonated is extended because all of the acid functional groups are on the same molecule. Once the first acid groups deprotonate and become ionized, if the pH is increased even further and more acid groups are to be ionized, they find themselves on a molecule that is already ionized. As a result, the pH needs to be even higher in order to rip off the next proton and then even more higher in order to rip off the proton after that, and so on and so forth. The curve of the polymer has a much more moderate slope than the S-curve of the small molecule acid, even though the same acid functional group is being used in each case. Thus, the halfway point on the chart, the pKf for the polymer, is shifted to a higher pH value from its small molecule's pKa counterpart. Because of this shift in the pKa app, polyelectrolytes appear to get weaker and weaker as they become more and more ionized. Lastly, I should point out that because this weakening of the pKa app is due to the already present charges on the polymer, any other electrolyte or salt which is added to the solution will begin to effectively screen these electrostatic interactions. Thus, as salt is added, each acid functional group, even though they are on the same molecule, will become more and more electrostatically isolated, and the pK app will become more and more constant. It will be less dependent on the extent of ionization, and therefore also less dependent on pH as well.